Okay, hello everybody, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sander Lutz, I'm a reporter with Decrypt. Andrea Berry, I work at Theta Labs. We are a layer one blockchain company with a proof of stake model. I'm, um, let's see, <laughs> five-year-old, I'll go with 15-year-old. Um, <laughs> But think of us like AWS for Web3. So we have companies building pointed solutions on our platform or their entire businesses on the, our platform. Uh, we, have, we started as a video streaming company actually and then pivoted, built our own peer-to-peer -peer CDN and our own proprietary blockchain. Uh, we also have an NFT marketplace so that helps our customers uh, have that consumer touch point. We have patented things like NFT DRM, so the concept of token gating, um, logging in as a 15-year-old, okay, logging in with your NFT instead of your email and password. Um, and my background has always been in video streaming infrastructure, helping companies launch their OTT and video apps and go-to-market strategies. That's how I joined Theta with its video and media entertainment focus. I've known Brandon, the CEO now, for what feels like maybe 10 years. So that's a great connection, and I got to meet Phil through the Film3 community just a few months ago. Awesome. Uh, David, how about you? Hi, guys. My name is David Bianchi. Uh, I'm an actor and independent filmmaker. Um, I'm the founder of a company called Exertion Films. Um, I guess I'm probably touted as having been one of the few fine artists to have minted um, an entire short film as a singular ERC721 token back in March of 2021. It's a piece called I Can't Breathe uh, that successfully auctioned to Medicoven, who bought the $69 million people. I then donated all those proceeds to the George Floyd Memorial Foundation and quickly became um, not only one of the thought leaders in independent film, NFTs, and blockchain, um, but also one of the leading socially conscious artists in fine art. I would then go on to be curated at Art Basel at Scope, um, spoken at some of the biggest stages in the, wor stages in the world, including um, Cam Lyon, um, <laughs> with uh, speak, uh, VCon with Gary Vaynerchuk, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, where I am now, um, I've produced six feature films, uh, countless credits in front of the in front of the camera, behind the camera, and my blockchain company is called Exertion Three. And is currently in direct partnership with a company called Gala. Some of you may be familiar with Gala. Um, they're one of the largest blockchain gaming companies in the world. They then went on to launch Gala Music, with partnerships with Ice Cube, Snoop Dogg, Too Short, a bunch of nobodies, um, and uh, and since then have now launched Gala Film. And so I am a premier partner with Gala Film, and I am the creator, uh, showrunner of the first ever major Hollywood episodic series to ever be produced by Web3 companies and released for the Ethereum blockchain. It's called Razor. Uh, we are going into principal photography literally in 11 fucking days. <laughs> and uh, we just locked Mina Suvari um, as of yesterday. I'm playing the title role, the title role of Grimm. Um, it's a dystopian series, basically Black Mirror meets Mr. Robot that takes you deep into the world of neural implants, hacker culture, and the underbelly of black market crime. Um, there's a lot of utility that we do around that. We dropped our first NFT collection early, early, early in development. So storyboards, animatics, conceptual drawings, pre-visualizations, and so these NFTs also have earning potential if you own a node in the Gala Film ecosystem. Um, so there's a lot of really, really interesting modalities that we've built, so that's why I'm here. And oh, by the way, uh, shout out to Camp to Crypt. Camp to Crypt is fire. Yeah. They're going to be covering our live table read on Monday. And Phil is just a legend. That's how I ended up here. Beautiful. Um, and Phil, it makes some sense why you're here, but I'll let you take it away. For sure. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Phil McKenzie. So I'll start with uh, yeah how I got involved and in my story to, to get here is um, founded CEO of a company called GoFinch. So um, leading UK. Um, financier and producer for film and TV. Uh, about two years ago, went down in a sort of rabbit hole on, on Web3, saw the possibilities like probably a lot of people in the room do in terms of solving a lot of problems and um, you know improving a lot of things that, that we do in the entertainment um, sector. That led to us setting up a crypto crowdfunding platform. We successfully raised some funds for a film using you know NFTs. Um, that led to a lot of attention and sitting on panels and being asked how did we do it. Um, not that anyone really knew how anybody was doing anything at that stage. Um, one of those panels was with, with Umair where we just um, kept in touch and chatted. I knew about M Content before the panel. I was impressed. I was impressed that no one had really heard about them, but they'd achieved so much in such a short space of time. When I met the guy, you know, you know, I, I, I saw why they had. 
And from then, we sort of spent a few months trying to work out how could we work together to really, you know, build on what, a, what an amazing base had been built. Because still today, kind of six months later, it's amazing what the companies achieved, like Dr. Louise said, Brandon and Mayor all, all, all kind of told you before, um, in terms of the platform, the tech, the community. Um, and my role in that is on the content side. So my pitch to, to, to the guys was, you can't go up against Netflix, you can't go up against the big guys, it, 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 would, be, it would be suicidal. You need to think about this gorilla, you need to come at it thinking how can we, how can we squeeze the most out of this budget across them, as many possible fantastic projects. Um, and how can we monetize that as well? How can we generate revenues as well, which is you know, the lifeblood of any business, but you know, even, even more so a young one. Um, and so that led me coming on board as the, the, the chief content officer, so building out their content slate, their content strategy, but like with any young, fast-growing business, you know, involved in various other areas as well in helping form and shape and drive everything forward. Um, so yeah, that's how I mean. Well, I actually love that you brought up warfare because that's the first thing I was thinking about that I wanted to ask everyone um, and how you articulate what type of warfare uh, you all are engaging in. Because uh, the first, my first impression from the lovely presentation we just saw a few minutes ago was when you were looking at like how content has changed over the last you know 20 years, I think you go even back further. I think it makes total intuitive sense, like they were saying, um, that uh, this next phase is that like the viewer wants more and more and more, and what they want is to participate. That to me, I have no issue with. That makes perfect sense why they would want that. But the thing is, seeing all those different developments over the history of film, right? You know, going from theatrical to home video to um, from cable and um, and broadcast into you know streamers and even into YouTube and Instagram and TikTok. With all of those previous, I don't know if you call them mini revolutions or shifts, it still feels like centralized power still got a piece of the pie. So there was no real threat. There were shifts here and there, but like you know those companies that kind of at the epicenter of media and content still found a way to win. Whereas this shift does seem fundamentally different from all those ones that came before it and that this if, if the viewer is winning in the same way like it sounds like which totally makes sense they would want to what is the role for these centralized powers for you know the media industry the powers that run Hollywood etc in that so I'm curious what you all think like so are you at war is it just guerrilla war instead of I don't know full battleships and I don't know what the hell out of this metaphor needs to get but like is it actually war that's happening and therefore you know is that a much more daunting shift than these other shifts previously or do you think that there are ways to keep these powers that be who you do you need them on your side and are there ways for them to win in this too um, David I, I want to start with you because you, you seem to be right on the fulcrum of both worlds and what are your observations on that uh, shout out to NFT Film Squad, by the way. Um, I don't think it's a war at all. I mean, because I, listen, I come from a place of attacking the island and burning the boat. Like, I came to Los Angeles with a theater degree and I got my SAG card doing extra work. Like, you know what I'm saying? I've been at battle my career. There's no nepotism in my story. Um, and so, when I look at the distinction between Web 2 and Web 3, the major distinction is one, transparency, decentralization, you got a little bit, and you got the digital ownership component, right? The big boys are going to stomp their feet around. But they're, they don't have time, nor do they have the desire to be experimental. They don't need to. They're, they're printing money, you know? Whereas we, the independents, and sort of like the movers and shakers and stewards of this community, we are interested in it being experimental. One, because obviously we're motivated by money, don't get it twisted. But number two, we're also motivated by what you're talking about, which is the cultural shifting of the paradigm, right? So as it relates to film, cinema, short form, long form, I am under no illusions that film three cinema and film three episodic content will not work without web two exploitation. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the board ape yacht club, the board ape yacht club effect, that's culture vulturism, right? That is basically cultural velocity. That's why the floor of a BAYC is currently about still about seventy seven ETH at last I checked, and so. What we're doing, say for example, our model is to produce stuff that is Web3 native, Web3 born with Web3 ethos, philosophies, and undertones and stories and narratives. We can build lore through tokenomics. We can engage our community into the Hollywood ecosystem and into the culture of the filmmaking process, release exclusively on Web3, which is creating distribution and creating a pear-shaped model. However, we are very much interested and immediately we will then go SVOD worldwide. 
Because what we want to do is we want to work with the giants to be able to rise the water under the Web3 community, right? To me, that makes the most sense. I always think about the, like a Web3 wallet like sobriety. Like, I can tell you, you got to get sober, but until you emotionally believe you need to get sober, you're not going to stop drinking, right? And a Web3 wallet is the same. I can tell somebody, you got to get a Web3 wallet. Crypto, NFT is going to make a lot of money. Until people feel emotionally connected with the why, they're not going to do it. So if we can get Web2 audiences to be compelled by a really compelling, high concept cinematic series, and then let them hear people are making money off something that they're already emotionally connected to, just like NBA Top Shot, they will find a way to get a Web3 wallet. And now we've got Web2 minds working in a Web3 ecosystem in an organic and fluid way. Uh, Andrea, I'd like to get your perspective from like a infrastructure, more technical side, if that's from you know the, the creative side too. So yeah, what does that war look like and is it a war? Well, I think that's the funnest part of my job is going in to meet with these traditional media executives and you can just tell they're already closed off and skeptical. But I always say my, the best sales strategy for tier one media is FOMO. So I get the meeting and I'm educating them, but my job is to demystify Web3. And the fun part about it is to explain, because what they hear is that the creator wins, the viewer wins, and they feel and they assume that they're being robbed. But in reality, from an infrastructure perspective, it's solving some of their biggest pain points when we're thinking about margins and uh, how dependent they are on vendors and the manual labor it just takes for invoicing and rights management, um, the inability to have a meaningful relationship with the audience or community consumers uh, and proven ROI with that community investment is a dark art at best. And so to go in and educate them about how infrastructure is changing this is really fun because I see within the course of 60 minutes, the guard come down and that's really the focus of my job. So I think the assumption uh, is that we are at war and Theta is focused on helping companies lean in and be web two and a half. We'll integrate with AWS. We'll integrate with your tech stack. Like let us be complimentary and we found that a uh, easy way to do that is with NFTs. So we figure out what are your KPIs as a business. Now let's creatively think of an NFT project, whether that's in real life, virtual or a blend. I think it's always blend is the best, but we'll build an NFT marketing campaign that probably creates a new revenue stream. It's risk adverse to them. And through that process, because we offer managed services here, it demystifies Web3. And then they start to open their minds of, can you take a look at, tell me about smart contracts. Can you tell me about this? Can you tell me about that? And by that point, they trust us and we're able to make impact. So long way of explaining it, but uh, no, I don't think so. And I love when people assume that because I love playing a diplomatic role between technology groups and business groups. So you, do you think there's, a, there's space then, or do you predict that like, if you're going around converting Web2 companies to Web2.5, that like eventually that's what everyone will be doing and there would be space even for these centralized entities in a viewer-centric future, you know, 10, 20 years from now? Hopefully five, 10, yes. Yeah. But I agree, I think two and a half will normalize and um, kind of, like I said, let the guard down and allow for, um, I mean, we already see the wave of innovators. We're obviously all here today but it will normalize those efforts. Um, I come from the Silicon Valley, so that's where I see this is I remember growing up and seeing the boom of um, the internet, but apps being developed and anything goes and you know, engineers have blue hair all of a sudden and it's the wild west. I see that happening again now, but um, the difference is, is that we're all able to share, uh, have that brain share, communicate worldwide and um, create that wave of a movement to normalize these efforts. I mean. Web3 is solving serious, real problems. It's not a nice to have, it's a need to have. And people will figure that out. Um, I think at the studio level, it's, you know, I always say like, um, we think we've talked about it, Phil, on these panels is they don't want to be first, but they want to be the first second. Yeah. And once that starts happening, they're going to have that FOMO and they're going to test and they're going to evolve and it will benefit the creator the consumer and the business. Like everybody really wins if set up properly. Um, the other question related to this that I had um, watching the presentation and learning more about Myco 
uh, you know, you mentioned like a Ronaldo soccer match and what if he had no one watching or, you know, like you guys got this cricket match on and obviously that was a huge pull because you have a whole part of the world like so invested in this single thing. And, you know, when you talk about decentralization in the context of media, like part of what has made media work forever is some form of centralization, right? This is the movie everyone has to see. This is the sports game that everyone around the world is watching at once. And in this future, if, and I mean, this is already happening with TikTok and Instagram, this is just a continuation of it. But if things keep, you know, becoming smaller and smaller in terms of, of audience or in terms of the content library out there, and if there's not that much of a monoculture anymore, Phil, I'm curious, like, wh where, where do you see the importance of centralization of attention and how does that factor into what, what Myco is building? That's a big question. Um, I, I don't think, just to pick you up on, I don't think things get smaller and smaller and smaller. I think you can still go after big tentpole films. You just come at it from a decentralized approach and a community building approach. And I think this is where we are at loggerheads, not quite at war, with you know a tradition that's one of the most centralized and hierarchical that, that exists. And you know, to just echo what, they, what, 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 what everyone else is saying, you know, for that to change, it, the, the tipping point is going to be that piece of content that gets everyone's attention that we haven't quite got. Maybe it's you know, David's film, I hope it is. Um, and also it's the commercials of it. It's finding a way, I think Andrea, you're saying it, that, that it's another revenue stream and another you know, commercial outlet for, for these centralized and traditional places that really turn them onto this opportunity that lies lies within Web3. And the power of community, which is completely opposite to, 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 to how these businesses have been built in the past. And when you, when you switch yourself onto it, not just the creative side of that, not just the funding side of it, but also the power of getting, you know, the community behind the distribution of content, you know, is, 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 is what everyone is kind of looking for, every brand and product out there is trying to find. How do I engage with the community? How do I harness the power of the community? Web3 is another set of tools to help, to help content creators do that and, and, and also to empower the viewers we're trying to do in micro a little bit more. And I think also like, not, you know, there, there are a lot of these questions about Web3 and what it will look like in terms of media, but I think it's also kind of used to be an unsaid secret. Now it's kind of spoken that like, what's currently happening in streaming is not working. <laughs> like, it, 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 it seemed like it was going for a little while, but you know, it's all these companies, uh, burning money essentially to try to beat the other to be the last one standing, but obviously that obviously that it's not happening. And talking about splintering, there are way too many streaming services out there, each that are trying to become the one and people are already rolling back budgets and consolidating and like I thought this was kind of like just not uh, conspiracy theory, but just like a rumor, you know, that like is Disney gonna get, you know, conglomerate with, with Netflix or be bought by Apple or that sort of thing. But like I know people at these companies and they think that's like a pretty realistic possibility. So I'm just curious because I think it's very cool Oh, that um, we have all these perspectives here from a production side, infrastructure side, creative side. And I know you all overlap in some of those too. But like what do you diagnose as the issues with the current landscape? And I'm sure that will factor into what you're doing right now. Then I'll focus on the viewer. Like the, the companies are focused on other stakeholders involved in the whole value chain. You've got to be focused on the viewer um, and empowering them in order to you know, deliver better rewards to them and better experiences to them. That is the only way we're going to win the battle, the war, um, against the big guys, is by providing something that is better to what is already there. And that is, that is experience and reward based in, in, in our eyes at Myco for the viewer. Um. Yeah, it's a loaded question. I have a lot to say. I get really fired up about the streaming wars. I call them the churn wars. They're all just buying their customers back and another dark art of how do we figure out the margins that with the content, with the marketing, with the infrastructure. Um, and I think that to your question, consumers are fed up because we know they're selling our data and making money off of our data. Uh, they have singular revenue streams other than selling our data, but they have a subscription. All you can watch or, or not. Or now Netflix is even p making you pay for ads, which that gets me really fired up, is again, it's lacking the, what the viewer wants um, from an infrastructure side. 
it's throwing money at problems. And like Netflix lost a million subscribers in one quarter and they were proud to deem that as a success. That's insane. That's ridiculous. And so they're all fighting at the top and they have arguably similar li libraries. I worked at Vimeo on the enterprise team and we had a white label Netflix solution. So anybody could launch their own Netflix, everyone from the pastor to the fitness instructor to Tribeca shortlist, Criterion channel and whatnot. And there were a thousand of those channels and when we aggregated the data and we looked at the trends, uh, the more niche the audience, the less churn they had, so loss of a subscriber. So the more niche, because as a consumer you felt tied to that identity and part of a community rather than one to many. And then on the pricing side, the more niche the audience, when the price would increase, the more niche the audience, zero churn. And for the more general Hollywood, you know, comparable to Netflix and whatnot um, uh, channels, when they increased the price even by $4, they had like 30% churn. That's insane. And so what that told me and what got me really into Web3, Web3 is community infrastructure. That was this aha moment that, okay, this is going to solve a lot of problems in the streaming space. And uh, one of those things I think is the concept of an NFT subscription. Really, that's a membership that could have perpetual revenue. And there is no churn at that point. Um, but I'll stop there because I can keep talking. Wow. So this is, this is a really fascinating question. I think one of the biggest obstacles that we're facing is communication. So what I really loved about when I was watching the micro presentation is when you led with what your platform is, I'm paraphrasing, it's a vertical, pla vertical streaming platform where you can earn. Blockchain was the last thing. That's very clever. Keep it that way, right? When we think about electricity, I just want to turn on the lights and know it works. I don't have to understand opposing currents, and I really don't care. And nor does the end consumer. So that's something that we really have to think about, is not leaning on the tech, just leaning on how do we make really, really user-friendly UI, UXs that the TikTokers, that the YouTubers, that the Generation Zs, Xers, or whatever letter of the alphabet can grab onto and call it easy and have fun. That's one of the most important things that we have to do, is the UI, UX has to be seamless and really, really clean. Now, from a creative perspective, I need to also understand that when I'm creating, whether it's episodic series or whether I'm creating feature film, it's all about story. And it's all about execution. If we look at some of the greatest independent films ever made, whether we're talking about Boogie Nights or we're talking about Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs, these are people in rooms talking. But how do you make people in rooms talking compelling? Whether you're dealing with five minutes, six minutes, 10 minutes, or 90 minutes. If you create great content, people will look for you. Paranormal Activity is a great example of that. Blair Witch Project is a great example of that. And there's a list that goes on at infinitum. And so my job is to, to rise to the best of my ability to create content that is compelling, that is sophisticated, so that the big boys come sniffing around for me. Now what's cool with what I'm doing specifically as it relates to Web3 is that I have a really interesting situation with Gala. And I don't mind dropping this alpha because Gala is an incredible creator economy community forward system. In other words, they said, David, we love you, we trust you, we know you're going to do something compelling. Let's go to work together. So we are in direct partnership, but I control the intellectual property, right? That doesn't happen at the studio level. <laughs> no fucking way. You know, they want to buy it, they want to own it for obvious reasons. Look, they're, they're, they're flipping big bucks. Um, and so the most important thing that I have to think about is how do I communicate to an audience in a way that speaks to their soul, that speaks to their spirit? That's what's going to create the social media flair. That's, when get, that's what's going to get the hashtags going, right? Nobody wants to pay an influencer unless you've got X amount of millions of followers. Well, how do you get that? You have an influencer that taps into a community's mind, body, spirit, and soul. And so as a storyteller, that really, really is my job. And then the digital collectible components that are associated with that are kind of secondary, right? Now, it's cool that my community can buy and sell and trade NFTs, and they might have an ascension, they might have a descension. But the most important thing for me is creating sophisticated content that will stand the test of time. The final piece of this is I'm also leaning into what the younger generation wants to see. So Razor, for example, I specifically designed it to be a short form episodic series. My episodes are gonna run anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes total runtime because I wanna create a piece of content that somebody can watch on the D train. So Quibi did this. But where Jeffrey Katzenberg failed is that he didn't follow the old Greek fable that is if it isn't on the page, it's not on the stage. You can't produce a feature film, cut it into 20 pieces, and call it episodic. Like, episodic is a specific three-act structure. You have to follow the, 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 the architectural narrative. 
And so, again, I, that may sound a little self-indulgent, but I'm pretty good at what I do. And I think that the audience that we're, that we're creating content for will reciprocate and feel the same way, and I hope that we rise above because of that. Um, that exactly addresses the uh, next question I had. Um, and this is going to be the last question, then maybe we'll go to if anyone in the audience has questions as well. But, you know, like what are we talking about here? Are we just talking about a delivery method, method of content? And at the end of the day, is the content the same? Is what makes a good story the same? And I was, I'm glad you brought up Quibi, because I was thinking of that earlier, too. Because, like, they at least said that, you know, they were changing everything. But it's funny, because then you see afterwards, it's like a Quibi series, and they, Quibi went bankrupt, and then they just turned it back into a movie. Because it really was, at the end of the day, a movie that they spliced up. Um, but I guess, Phil, bring it back to you. You were saying a few minutes ago, like what you're looking for at the end of the day is that piece of content that breaks through, that you know can get a platform on the map, can get that word of mouth, and that's all really, this has all ever been. When you're looking for that content, are you looking at it in the same way, like let's say you worked at a movie studio 20 years ago, or kind of like David's saying, is the nature of the content itself also slightly different because of this new environment we're in? I think all this amazing new tech still can't hide a bad script uh, <laughs> or a bad filmmaker. Um, I think what's changed is there's all these new and interesting ways you can leverage that IP and take that story in different directions and different mediums you can use um, and experiences you can hang around it and rewards you can give your viewers like we are through, through Myco. So, um, the, the, yeah. You can't, you can't make up for a bad script or a bad filmmaker, but the tools are there now to amplify it and own it and better control it and deliver better experiences and rewards. Cool. Um, now, if anyone in the audience has any question for any of our panelists, uh, we can maybe bring you the mic if you have anything to ask. 